Hello. I hope everyone is having a good time at the conference this year. My name is Ruandi, and I am happy to be presenting a recorded presentation on my research to you. Uh, I'm attached to GSBL, and my supervisors are Dr. Hazel Messenger and Dr. Wendy Bloisey. And my research is on exploring the role of unlearning in the development of lecture identity among part-time higher education lecturers based in the private higher education sector of Sri Lanka. Yes, it's quite a mouthful. Um, so 15 minutes is not too long, but I hope that I will be able to give you a brief uh, understanding about my research. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about my research journey so far, um, a little bit about the background, about my study, and I'm going to dwell a little bit on the literature that I have been exploring. Um, I'll quickly take you through my methodology plan and the next steps of my research, uh, aligning with the past, present, and future theme of this year's conference. Um, so talking about the past, um, so this um, I have completed up to my pilot study, which I concluded early on this year, and um, I've been uh, doing my literature review. Of course, um, I don't think it will ever be completely done because new new things keep on coming. Uh, I've been doing working on my methodology plan. I uh, got my thick approval, and like I said, I completed my pilot study uh, beginning of this year, and I'll be hoping to. Uh, finish my data collection before the end of the year. Um, so talking about uh, my study, I have to tell you a little bit about the background. So I'm based in Sri Lanka and so is my study. And I don't know how many of you have come to Island Nation, but those of you who have know that we are uh, an island that has everything in the world except snow. Uh, however, when it comes to education in Sri Lanka, uh, we have quite a few unique characteristics. Number one, uh, we have a very rich heritage and history of education that goes all the way back to the third century BC. Uh, it comes from a very Buddhism big based education system where uh, knowledge has been transferred and shared from guru to student, guru to student. And this teacher-centered education system still prevails today. Um, yes, our island has been under colonial influence, so our prevailing education system does have uh, a lot of influence from uh, the Portuguese, Dutch, and the British. However, it's very interesting to see that the teacher-centeredness of our education still prevails. And for better or worse, it's not only prevalent in primary and secondary education, but also tertiary, including higher education. So teachers are highly venerated. They are highly respected and even worshipped by some learners. And um, learners look to teachers to give them uh, knowledge. Um, so that is one unique characteristic of Sri Lanka uh, and our education system. The other is that when you look at our higher education, uh, the majority of lecturers are part-time lecturers um, who actually have a full-time uh, career, full-time professions. Now, uh, up until about four or to five years ago, I myself was a part-time lecturer. Uh, and then, of course, I made the switch to become a full-time um, full faculty. And when I made that switch, I realized that I was now looking at teaching and learning in a completely different way. Um, I'm not saying it's a better way or a, um, or, or, a, or a different way in terms of good or bad, but it's a different way because I'm, I'm my identity now as a full-time educator is very different to my identity as a part-time educator. So after that experience, I was very interested to see and to explore whether part-time higher education lecturers in Sri Lanka practice some sort of unlearning of their corporate identities or their professional identities and how this happens because they are working during uh, the, the week and then they lecture on the weekends or on weekday nights. How do they make this switch back and forth, back and forth? So I was very interested to kind of explore how and if unlearning was practiced. And also, I was also interested to see because unlearning is part and parcel to me uh, of being a teacher because you are constantly required to adhere to and improve yourself and your uh, teaching practices based on the needs of today. Like all of us saw when the pandemic hit and online education kind of uh, blossomed. So I was very interested to see whether 
lecturers, part-time lecturers in higher education practice unlearning? And if so, how do they do it? Um, so telling you a bit more about my study, my research question is to explore in what ways do part-time higher education lecturers in Sri Lanka practice unlearning in developing their teacher identity? And my aim is to really explore the process of unlearning that these lecturers practice uh, in order to come up with recommendations on how we can actually use the concept of unlearning to develop lecture identities better uh, so that we are not hindered by our previous perceptions of learning and teaching or our other identities, including our professional occupations outside of teaching. Um, so my research objectives are threefold. Um, number one, I uh, will be ex uh, exploring existing literature on the concept of unlearning. Number two, I will be actually looking at how unlearning is practiced among part-time higher education lecturers in Sri Lanka. So I want to know about what are the challenges they have? How do they overcome these challenges? How do they practice unlearning if they are doing it? And of course, how they perceive unlearning in terms of lecture identity development. And finally, um, I hope to provide recommendations to uh, these lecturers on how to use unlearning to improve their identity better. Now, talking about unlearning, um, let me tell you the first thing that I did uh, was read. So when I was reading literature, what I found was that many scholars have actually touched upon the concept of unlearning without really calling it that. Um, because unlearning is not a new concept. It came up in the 1980s, uh, but it's also not a concept that has been fully researched as well. So there's a lot of uh, research gaps and a lot of room for more studies to happen. So what I found was that many authors use different words um, from forgetting to discarding to reinterpreting, to readjusting, all of which talks of unlearning in some way or the other. And also something I found was that when it first came out, unlearning was more of a negative concept because it was a harsh concept. It talked about how difficult it was to let go of previous knowledge to make way for the new. Um, it was painful, it's a struggle, it's a challenge. People, you know, uh, try not to do it. Uh, but over time, we see uh, with 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 the uh, many studies that have been conducted, the concept kind of evolves to be more positive. And today it's seen as as a part of the lecturing, a part of the learning process. It's intertwined. Many authors have said that you can't separate one from the other um, and that unlearning doesn't have to stop for learning to happen, but it kind of happens, you know, together. Uh, so based on the, the studies that I've read and based on the scholars that I have been taking inspiration from, I have come up with my own definition of uh, unlearning, uh, which I'm not going to read out to you, but I'm looking at it as a facilitating component of the learning process where, number one, we should consciously know whether we have previous knowledge that is maybe inadequate, maybe outdated, and we should try to reduce their influence and, of course, prevent them from inhibiting our openness to new learning. And once we do understand any limitations of previous knowledge or previous practices, we have to then move on to kind of readjusting these uh, practices and knowledge so that learning can take place. So like I said earlier, unlearning doesn't have to stop for learning to begin, but it, it happens simultaneously, it happens together so that we continue transforming from an older self into a new desired self. Um, talking of literature, um, I was also very, very interested to find out whether unlearning, which has been touched on by Western scholars, I was in interested to see whether this has been um, known or, or, or looked at um, by scholars in the East. So what I found was that, yes, it has been looked at, of course, using different words, um, but mostly in the realms of philosophy and religion. So I, I have just... Um, uh, put here just four instances of that um, just to take you through. Um, so something that I found was that unlearning is 
part and parcel of the Buddhism philosophy where the Buddha himself has endorsed uh, uh, unlearning in his pedagogy and he has spoken about how his students uh, have to really let go of deeply held beliefs in order to learn something new. And unlearning is also aligning with the second truth of the Buddha where he says that we have to, in order to end all suffering, we need to know where that suffering is coming from. So um, what, what he says in essence is that you have to liberate your mind from any epistemological errors. Of course, unlearning is also looked at um, in the Zen uh, philosophy of teaching where teachers actually um, help students to remove uh, fixed ideas from their minds before uh, they move on to learning new things. So it's very interesting that Eastern philosophy and religion have looked at unlearning because although my study will be influenced by Western um, Western studies and Western scholars, my data will be coming from Sri Lanka and this part of the world. So I really hope that I will be able to find and really um, explore unlearning from both these lenses. Um, talking of literature, uh, I also want to discuss a little bit about the studies that I have been reading so far that have looked at how lecturers and teachers practice unlearning in terms of their lecture identity development. So um, when it comes to identity, it's anyway complex. And scholars have spoken about how teachers actually keep changing their identity and they keep on improving, keep on evolving and all sometimes it happens consciously, sometimes it happens unconsciously, and sometimes some teachers even resist changing their identity because they'd rather cling on to you know a previous more comfortable identity than embrace a new one. So unlearning has been found by many scholars to be a very important part of being a teacher, being a lecturer, because like I said previously, teachers are forever called to. Um, let go of you know how they used to do things and um, kind of evolve to adapt to the demands of the day. So now this is very interesting when we look at the Sri Lankan picture because for the part-time higher education lecturers, unlearning needs to happen on at least two areas. Number one, uh, unlearning in terms of reevaluating re the previously held notions and understanding of what it means to be a lecturer, what it means to be a teacher, and also unlearning and balancing their lecturer identity with their professional identity. So it's very interesting to see whether one becomes a barrier to the other, and if so, how do these lecturers kind of do boundary crossing. So uh, lots of questions to be answered, really. And uh, yes, there have been empirical studies that have found that lecturers do practice unlearning and that lecturers do navigate between multiple identities. But I did not find too much of literature that, that explored how this was done. So this is um, an area, a, a research gap that I really hope that I will be able to bridge uh, with my study. Um, let me quickly take you through my methodology plan. Um, so my study is governed by social constructivism and an interpretive paradigm. And I am using phenomenology as an approach, um, basing it on a more qualitative methodology. So my data collection plan uh, is in two phases. Uh, the first phase, I will be conducting focus group discussions among part-time higher education lecturers coming from five different private higher education institutes in Sri Lanka. And after I finish uh, my focus groups, I will be conducting one-on-one -on -one in-depth interviews with consenting participants. Um, here, I really want to uh, try and explore their personal unlearning experiences, their, their perception of unlearning, and their personal practices in terms of uh, teacher identity development. So um, I was able to co uh, complete my pilot study from which I um, learned a lot of things uh, to improve myself uh, as a researcher. And uh, I learned a lot of interesting tidbits um, from how part-time educators looked at unlearning. It was positive. Um, and also they saw their daytime, their, their full-time occupations as being helpful and 
uh, facilitators of who they were as lecturers. So that was very interesting for me. And I really hope that I'll be able to, um, you know, find more, more, more data uh, by the end of the year, which will help my analysis. Um, so the next phase of my research is, of course, uh, finishing my data collection and then moving on to the analysis. Uh, so that's what I've been doing in the past and what I'm doing in, at present and what I hope to do uh, in future next year. Um, so I hope that you were uh, able to get a brief uh, understanding about my research and I would be very happy to answer any questions um, if should you have any. Thank you very much.